So here's my cleaned up drawings for the snail. Now I had to I had to go through and do a lot of Photoshop on it in order to uh, to fix up the proportions because my you'll remember when I cleaned up the original drawing this one here I made the the shell really small so you can see the difference between this one and this one here it's quite dramatically different so I just went back and and uh, cut and pasted some of them and just modified some of the shapes just slightly just put them in proportion and also rotated some of the um, the swirls on here. So this one here, you can see that the perspective on the swirl sort of indicates that if I was to draw a cross contour line cutting the shell in half in perspective, it would slice it right through there. But if you look at some of these ones here, this one in particular, this swirl has been shifted over in this direction which pulls your center line over there. So I just went in and cut and shifted it over just to get it to, to work a little bit better. So the final version actually looks quite nice. Um, with all the proportions and everything running through. Uh, but we'll use this to uh, to add on our secondary action of the, uh, the tail or the antenna in this case here. So the theory behind this uh, action is it's overlapping action again. Um, essentially what we're doing is when we when we did our first ball we had our first ball here and then the second ball we put up on top of here um, when I added the third ball for the character's head over here I attached it with a line which was the neck which is essentially this line right through here so if you watch the action just on this particular part of the head You can see the action as it moves up and then comes down. You see the curvature of it? So on the way up, coming here, it's dragging like this, and then when it comes back down again, it drags in this direction and then flips and hits. So the action is basically an up and down action that's taking place like this. And that's essentially the tail that we're going to be putting onto the character. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show it by adding on antennas onto the top of his head there. What I would like you to do, if you've only got the two balls, you've got the one ball here and the second ball here, you have two choices with what you can do. You can either add a tail onto the first ball, so if I just draw off to the side here, let's say this is my first ball, and this is the second ball here. You can attach a tail to the bottom here, like this, or if you want to, you can put it on this side as well, totally up to you. Or you can treat it as though it's a character, and in the other class I did the Daffy Duck bouncing. I don't know if you guys saw the, the video for that. Um, in yesterday's class I went through and, uh, and did arms on the character. So I treated this part here as the pelvis girdle of the character. This is the chest of the character, and then his neck came out and into his head here. So it's similar to what we've got here. But I attached his shoulder to this point on his rib cage here. And so I had his wings coming from this point. So my this line here in this action of dropping down was actually right about there. And then I put another arm on the opposite side or a wing on the opposite side and had the character looking as though every time he bounced he would flip his arms up and down like this. So in yesterday's class we went through and we, we did the, the breakdowns and, and uh, cleaned up or, or did all the in-betweens for this action using a simple line and then I went in and added in the, the feathers for the wings. I then took that home last night, cleaned the whole thing up on pencil, and then scanned it, photoshopped it, colored, and then dropped in a background and panned the background in behind the character and modified the action. Similar to what I did with the snail. Again, if you watch the video of the snail last week, you'll notice that in this animation the character is going straight up and down. I just went in and modified the positioning of the character so it looks like the character is doing this type of a circular act, which then creates the feeling that there's a ground underneath it and we're following the character as they're hopping forward. So I did the same thing with Daffy Duck, and uh, I've got the final version of that on my memory stick. I'll bring it into class and stick it on the computer and show it to you. But I'll also tack it on to the uh, end of yesterday's class's uh, demo, and then I'll do the same thing with this one. I'll take this, uh, clean the whole thing up in pencil with the antennas and all that stuff, and then dump it into Photoshop, fix it up, 
colorize it, put it in with the background, and then pan the background in behind it to show you the variation on that one as well. So, options that you have here are you can attach a tail to this part here, or you can make it an arm that's up here, or if you've already done the secondary ball, like the head part here, and it's doing a head smacker type thing, then essentially you've completed this part of the assignment, adding the tail onto it. All right? Just so long as this line that's through here is doing that up and down action. So we'll take a look at that later on in class. So those are your different options that you have. Now if you want to, here's the other thing that I'll allow you to do, is if you want to take this simple line that we're going to do for the animation of, of the tail, the antenna, or the arms, whichever you're planning on doing, if you're doing a tail, if you want to modify that, and actually turn it into a three-dimensional volume tail, something like that, like a rat's tail, or if you want to put a tuft of hair on the end of it like this and turn it into you know, like a, a lion's tail, or if you want to you know, puff it up and, and add some fur to it like that, you can do that as well. Right. So I'll let you, let you do any option that you want to um, to modify it. And the same thing goes for your two balls. If you've just got the two balls like this, if you want to then take it the next stage, and actually turn it into a character, go ahead and do that. All right? There won't be any penalty if you mess up on it. Okay, I won't take any grades away from you. What I really want to see is, I, in this week's class, I want to see the two balls bouncing. And we'll talk about that. Um, and then next week, I want to see the two balls with a tail or an arm. Just the simple line is all you have to do as a bare minimum. But if you choose to go the next stage and start to fill it up with some volume and, 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 uh, and add a character to it, then Go ahead, all right? So I'll let you have fun with that later on. So there, there are a number of different ways of approaching um, overlapping action. As we talked about last week, and if you watched the video on Daffy Duck, you saw the application of, of his body, and what we've done here is slightly different. Um, so there are different ways of approaching it. Um, if you wanna see the, the pure uh, example of what this is here, if you want to carry it to that stage, then go to the YouTube uh, or go to the, the video lecture series and watch the uh, summer version of this class and you'll see this shown exactly. So the version that I'm going to show you in this class will be the modification doing the antennas, which is essentially the exact same theory. The only difference here is that I'm using this circle here for his cranial mass as this ball here. Okay, And I'm just adding on the same line of action will be present in this as it would be in this one here. So you can follow along and adapt it to what you're doing or just sit back, relax, watch, and then do it later. All right? So when we're approaching this, um, there are a number of different things that you have to be thinking about. Number one is who is your character? What's the character doing? Why are they doing it? Uh, what's the character's personality? What's the, uh, the character's weight? What's the effect of gravity on the character? What's the surface that they're bouncing off of? various things like that and so you're you're constantly thinking about why your lines are going where they're going and is the action doing what it's doing so in the case of doing something like this we're when we approach it at first we're starting off with a primary ball which is our main motivator that's the main body of, of action that's taking place and then we add on secondary action or overlapping action which was in this case here the shell of the character and then we added on another secondary action which was the head then we added on another one, which is the tail. So we got into four different things last week. Now we're adding on the fifth, which would be the antennas. And the approach that I'm using here is layered, so that I'm, I'm attacking it in different stages, not trying to do the whole drawing all at once. And I, that's one of the things I want you to take away from what we're talking about over the last three weeks, is that in animation, it's not like you sit down and you do this beautiful drawing of a snail in the exact position that the snail's supposed to be in with all the th different parts of the character, and then you put another sheet of paper down, and you draw the next position of the character, all cleaned up. You don't approach it that way. You have to approach it in several different layers so that you know exactly how the effect of what the primary action is doing, how it's affecting the secondary action. Right? So don't feel like it has to be completely done right at the very beginning. This is one of the, the major flaws that I ran into when I was first starting animation in school is I thought this is what all your drawings should look like right from the very beginning. And everything's turned out for me stiff. And it wasn't until I started to break it down and one of my instructors said, don't do that. And he started smacking me around and said, keep your stuff rough and loose. And that's when it's, it started to dawn on me, okay, I can be as crappy as I, 
or ugly with my drawings as possible. But then I realized that I'm going to put another sheet of paper over top of it and trace over it and clean it all up. Okay, so again, different stages. All right, so as we're approaching this piece of animation, we have drawing number one, which is up at the top. And you remember from last week's class when we were doing the overlapping action of the shell, we don't start with drawing number one because we're not exactly sure where the antenna are going to be in this drawing. So what we do is we flip forward to the drawing that we are absolutely sure we know what's going to be happening with the antenna as far as the drag goes, and that's going to be my drawing number five, or even, in this case, number six. Because this is where the character is coming down really hard, and they're just about to touch the ground here, so I'm pretty much assured that if I draw the antenna on here, these antenna are going to be stretched out. So I'll just loop them up like this. And one of the things that I have to be concerned about, and this just goes for your overall drawing as well, is that we have a, a proper understanding of the perspective of the character. Now perspective is something that we don't really deal with a huge amount in animation, or most people don't think about it a lot in animation, but we have to remember that this character is eventually going to be placed into an environment that's going to have a horizon line with perspective plane that the character is going to be on, and therefore the character has to work to the perspective of the background. So if my horizon line in this scene is right about here, then all the perspective has to work to a vanishing point because I've shifted my character from a straight on side view, I've rotated the character into a slight three quarter view. So therefore, my vanishing point is no longer center of the field, it's shifted forward, right? It's just basic perspective stuff. So that if, let's say I had a cube here, and this cube was working to a horizon line right here, the vanishing point would be dead center, so therefore the interior of the box would look basically like this. Okay. Just basic one point perspective. But if I shift my vanishing point over to the side here, let's say I've got my horizon line here, and I use that same basic start off point for my cube, but I use the vanishing point that's over here, my plane now changes to this. So I can now see this front edge over here, which is this plane here, but on the other side. I've rotated the box around. So that's essentially what we're doing here with the characters. We've rotated the character around into a slight three-quarter front view, which is why we can see their opposite eye over there on the other side of their face. So a center line through the character's body would go down here. Same with the shell. That would be the center line coming through there. So if that's the case, then I need to understand where my horizon line is for this scene and understand that my eyes and my antenna are going to be going to that specific vanishing point so that when I draw it, I don't draw one too high. Okay. So I want my antenna to be angling down this way. Because the basic theory of perspective is that the closer something is to you, the larger it appears. The further away something is from you, the smaller it appears. And we've, I've always shown that by showing your hands put together like this. And you can see my hands are the same size. The heel of my hand lines up and the tips of my fingertips line up. But if I put my one hand here and bring this other hand forward like this, see what's happening? I'm lining up my wrist, but look at my fingers. These fingers here are shorter than these fingers. Holy crap, my hands are different sizes. But no, they're actually not. They're the same size. It's because this hand has come closer to us that it appears to be larger. This one's further away, so it appears to be smaller. So the perspective here would have an angle that's coming down like this to a vanishing point on the side. So that's what we need to do here with the antenna or the arms or hands or anything like that if you're dealing with that aspect on the character. So you can refer to the, the Daffy Duck version for a, a more expanded version because in that one we were dealing with the arms far apart. In this one here the antenna are fairly close but we still want to do that perspective. So I'll start off with my antenna straight up in the air like this because they're dragging down. And then we step forward through our animation, and we're basically now just straight ahead animating. So from 6 to 7, here's the path of action that I've created, the fact that the, the antenna are coming straight down. And you can see how the head here has shifted forward this way. So therefore, this is the, the same theory as the gymnast with the, the wand and the ribbon on the back of it that if the character's head is going to come down like this, it's going to create a path of action that's going to curve in this direction down here. So therefore, my antenna are now going to bend 
like this. So if I continue this line all the way through to my primary ball that's here, if you're doing the tail on the character's body, then this line would go through like this and loop this way. So this line would actually look like this. Okay, because it's connecting into the body of the character down here. Right, so the path of action is it drops down like this and then it curves around in this direction here. Now, this is my drawing number 7A. This is my favor okay, that I've taken into the low point there. So on this one here, what's happening is I'm following that same path of action coming through like this, and there's my character smacking his head down. My antenna are attached right here. So this part here is flattened out, so I'm going to want to pull my antenna, looping them back and around like this. So it's flowing in that direction. So now here's where the perspective thing is important. If my horizon line is up here and my vanishing point's right about here, that means my perspective plane is going like this. So therefore my antenna on the opposite side would have to follow this perspective line here. So that other antenna will be out here like this, and wrapping around his head. So it's going to be slightly shorter. And then I threw in a 7B here, just as an in-between on the way back up again, just to fill in that gap because it, it tended to spring just a little bit too quickly into my number 8 drawing, which was this one here. So the distance between here and here was just a bit too much, so I dropped another in-between in there just to fill in that space. So you probably didn't do that, so you don't have to worry about this drawing. But this would be the one where the character is starting to come up off the ground. So in this one here, I'm going to want to smack the antennas down onto the surface. But I don't want to lay them out flat here because they're coming down in this direction so the path of action would curve like this. <coughs> so I'm just backing up through the whole thing to this position here. So here's where my antenna are going to smack down here, but this part here is going to loop up and curl around like that. So again, my vanishing point's up here, so therefore my perspective will be going in this direction like this. The other antenna's on the opposite side there, so this antenna is now going to come out this front edge here and loop up and over like that. If it's off the ground, then you still have to follow that path of action. So your your 7A may be like this one here. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get to that one. You can treat this one as your 7A. <coughs> Just wait until we get there. So as I'm doing this, what I'm basically doing is I'm, I'm going to roll flip these so that I can see that the path of action on this action is moving properly. I'm just flipping the drawings like this in order from bottom to top to see that it's actually doing what I want it to do. So it's unrolling. So now with this drawing number eight, this is where it's starting to come back up again. Here's where I'm going to flatten the antenna out and let them smack onto the ground and start to drag out a little bit. Let them hit like that. And snap. And now on number nine, I'm starting to pull up off the ground. So my path of action is now going in this direction like this. So therefore my antenna are going to come across like this. And just be lightly touching the surface. Number 10, the head's starting to come up, and here's my connection point, so I follow that back through where I was before. So 
this would be the path of action now, curving in this direction. Back like that. So again, my connection point for the antenna is here, so I'm going to loop it back into where this line is coming from like this, so I'm going to have a little bit of an S-curve here on the, the antenna. Remember, your lines of action and paths of actions are either an S-curve or a C-curve. Always either an S or a C. Unless it's mechanical and then it becomes a straight line. But you're always looking for that nice S or C-curve in, in your actions. And now to number one. It's coming up, so again I attach it to this point here back up through the line that I just had to create my path of action. So now here is a C curve. Now the head's starting to pull back. Here's my line. I curl it around like this to link up into my line there. Therefore the antenna will be looped like this. Show the other antenna over here, just a sliver of it on the other side like that. And here's where the head goes all the way up its high point. So again, the path of action, I've got to follow what I started in here. It's coming up through like this and then the head comes up so therefore the path of action on this is going to loop over like that. There. And then the other one's going to crisscross over there. Like that. And I'm starting to release it so it's not tight in its curl, I'm starting to release it, the end of it out like this. And now the character begins to drop down. So I've got to follow that same line of action, path of action coming down here. position, which is starting to drop, and I had to shift this one, I've got a little notation here that I have to shift it, so in actual fact the positioning of this drawing is right about there. So you can see how the head lines up, if I keep it on the pegs in my instance here, it's going to move forward, which is going to modify my path of action to this, which is not what I actually want, so I've got to remember that my notation says that the head is dropping straight down, so therefore that would be my new path of action. So it's, it's subtle little things like this that are important that if you don't make little notations of them that you may run into problems later on you may forget about stuff because don't forget we did this a week ago right? and a lot of stuff has happened since last week you know I've been teaching two other classes in perspective and doing lectures with them and dealing with you know grids and stuff like that then I did the other class yesterday where I dealt with the, the Daffy Duck arms and now I'm on to this one so anything that I did I'm not necessarily going to remember because it's over a week ago and I've been doing other things. Did you say he threw uh, a paper or another frame between 7A and 7B? Yeah I did. Yeah. Seven? yeah I threw in a 7B. Yeah I put in another one there just as a, an in-between just to soften up the action coming out because it was a little bit too abrupt when I shot as a test. Between the smack and 7A right? Yeah, yeah I and coming back up again. So that's why in some cases with some animators you'll see little notations on their paper or there'll be things where they'll, they'll circle something and say change this or in my case you know remember the shell here is too small so I would put a circle around this and say enlarge this. Okay. So it doesn't matter what you write or, or put on your drawing because eventually you're going to clean it up on a separate sheet of paper and get rid of anything that's not essential to the drawing. So. Yeah, in some cases, some 
rough animation from some animators is all sorts of scribbly notes all over it, just the same as what I've got over here. This is nothing to do, well, it has something to do with what we're doing here, but it has nothing to do with this action in particular. It's just, you know, and I might even write down a, a list of things that I have to buy at the grocery store <laughs> at, at some point, you know. So stuff like that can, can be dealt with later on. Okay, so I've gone through and I put all the stuff on there, and we'll just check it by flipping it here to see whether or not it's doing what it should. It's got a really nice flow to it. It's just following behind what the head is doing. <coughs> Right? So I don't know if you can see it or not, but see that trailing line that I put on there that trace the, the path of action? If I describe what that line is through all the drawings, it's essentially this. It comes down like this, loops forward here, comes up and around, and loops up over here. See the figure that it's forming? It's a figure eight. Okay? That's the path of action that the head is following for this action. So my primary path of action for the ball bounce over here was straight up and down. Remember we folded the paper in half and we said here's your path of action. Going from this point to this point here, straight line. In this case here, the head is moving forward and back, so the path of action that it's following is creating this figure eight type of thing. In some cases you'll have a circular path of action. When I modified this to the forward jumping action, I actually have it doing this type of an action here where it hits the ground, drags across the ground, and then loops up. So it's forming this, an arc with a flat line. So when it jumps up into the air, he moves forward, reaches his high point, comes down, lands on the ground, slides across the ground, and then jumps forward again. So that's my path of action, is a sideways D. Your path of action can take any shape that you need it to take, depending on what the fulcrum point is, what the, the pivot point is, what the action requires just think it through and, and make it do what it's supposed to do. So this just requires a thought process of understanding why is your character doing what they're doing. So if I just loop this this way, so I can see that link up drawing in number four and five and six. Let's see how it blends there. There's that little shift that took place which will be corrected in the pencil tabs. Got a nice overall flipping action that's there. So the idea here is that not everything is happening at the same time. That's what overlapping action is. Primary action is the ball at the bottom of his body. Secondary overlapping action is the shell, the second ball, and then I've got my third overlapping action are the head and the tail, and then the fourth overlapping action is the ear, or sorry, the antenna. Adding it on as you go along. Okay. And I can continue on with this. The original idea was that we were going to put a bug on his back, riding on his back. I could still go in and add that in if I wanted to. I could put a little ladybug up on the, the back here and he's sort of riding on the, the shell. And he would react slightly differently than the rest of the stuff. That would again be delayed by another drawing. So as the character drops down, he might separate away from the, the shell as he comes down. And then when the shell goes back up again, he'll smack into it and compressed just like we did with the second ball. Okay. So it's just thinking the stuff through and planning it out in your head and executing it as you go along. So we'll take this shoot a pencil test of it, we'll take a look and see how it looks and uh, I'll dump the other stuff onto the computer as well. So for the assignment for next